Chapter One, Part One of The Water Babies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Corey Samuel. The Water Babies by Charles Kingsley. Chapter One, Part One. I heard a thousand blended notes. While in a grove I sat reclined, in that sweet mood when pleasant thoughts bring sad thoughts to the mind. To her fair works did nature link the human soul that through me ran, and much it grieved my heart to think what man has made of man. Wordsworth. Once upon a time there was a little chimney sweep, and his name was Tom. That is a short name, and you have heard it before, so you will not have much trouble in remembering it. He lived in a great town in the north country, where there were plenty of chimneys to sweep and plenty of money for Tom to earn and his master to spend. He could not read nor write, and did not care to do either, and he never washed himself, for there was no water up the court where he lived. He had never been taught to say his prayers. He had never heard of God or of Christ. Except in words which you have never heard, and which it would have been as well if he had never heard, he cried half his time and laughed the other half. He cried when he had to climb the dark flues, rubbing his poor knees and elbows raw, and when the soot got into his eyes, which it did every day in the week, and when his master beat him, which he did every day in the week, and when he had not enough to eat, which happened every day in the week likewise. And he laughed the other half of the day, when he was tossing halfpennies with the other boys, or playing leapfrog over the posts, or bowling stones at the horses' legs as they trotted by, which last was excellent fun, when there was a wall at hand behind which to hide. As for chimney sweeping, and being hungry and being beaten, he took all that for the way of the world, like the rain and snow and thunder, and stood manfully with his back to it till it was over. As his old donkey did to a hailstorm, and then shook his ears and was as jolly as ever, and thought of the fine times coming when he would be a man and a master sweep, and sit in the public house with a quart of beer and a long pipe, and play cards for silver money, and wear velveteens and ankle jacks, and keep a white bulldog with one grey ear, and carry her puppies in his pocket just like a man. And he would have apprentices one, two, three, if he could. How he would bully them and knock them about, just as his master did to him, and make them carry home the soot sacks, while he rode before them on his donkey, with a pipe in his mouth and a flower in his buttonhole, like a king at the head of his army. Yes, there were good times coming, and when his master let him have a pull at the leavings of his beer. Tom was the jolliest boy in the whole town. One day, a smart little groom rode into the court where Tom lived. Tom was just hiding behind a wall to heave half a brick at his horse's legs, as is the custom of that country when they welcome strangers. But the groom saw him and hallooed to him to know where Mister Grimes, the chimney sweep, lived. Now, Mister Grimes was Tom's own master. And Tom was a good man of business and always civil to customers, so he put the half brick down quietly behind the wall and proceeded to take orders. Mister Grimes was to come up next morning to Sir John Harthover's at the place, for his old chimney sweep was gone to prison and the chimneys wanted sweeping. And so he rode away, not giving Tom time to ask what the sweep had gone to prison for, which was a matter of interest to Tom, as he had been in prison once or twice himself. Moreover, the groom looked so very neat and clean, with his drab gaiters, drab breeches, drab jacket, snow-white tie with a smart pin in it, and clean round ruddy face, that Tom was offended and disgusted at his appearance, and considered him a stuck-up fellow, who gave himself airs because he wore smart clothes and other people paid for them, and went behind the wall to fetch the half brick after all. But did not, remembering that he had come in the way of business, and was, as it were, under a flag of truce. His master was so delighted at his new customer 
that he knocked Tom down out of hand, and drank more beer that night than he usually did in two, in order to be sure of getting up in time next morning. For the more a man's head aches when he wakes, the more glad he is to turn out and have a breath of fresh air. And, when he did get up at four the next morning, he knocked Tom down again in order to teach him, as young gentlemen used to be taught at public schools, that he must be an extra good boy that day, as they were going to a very great house, and might make a very good thing of it, if they could but give satisfaction. And Tom thought so likewise, and indeed would have done and behaved his best, even without being knocked down. For, of all places upon earth, Harthover Place, which he had never seen, was the most wonderful, and, of all men on earth, Sir John, whom he had seen, having been sent to jail by him twice, was the most awful. Harthover Place was really a grand place, even for the rich north country, with a house so large that in the frame-breaking riots, which Tom could just remember, the Duke of Wellington and ten thousand soldiers to match were easily housed therein, at least so Tom believed, with a park of deer, which Tom believed to be monsters who were in the habit of eating children, with miles of game preserves, in which Mr. Grimes and the collier lads poached at times, on which occasions Tom saw pheasants, and wondered what they tasted like, with a noble salmon river, in which Mr. Grimes and his friends would have liked to poach, but then they must have got into cold water, and that they did not like at all. In short, Harthover was a grand place, and Sir John a grand old man, whom even Mr. Grimes respected, for not only could he send Mr. Grimes to prison when he deserved it, as he did once or twice a week, not only did he own all the land about for miles, not only was he a jolly, honest, sensible squire, as ever kept a pack of hounds, who would do what he thought right by his neighbours, as well as get what he thought right for himself. But, what was more, he weighed full fifteen stone, was nobody knew how many inches round the chest, and could have thrashed Mr. Grimes himself in fair fight, which very few folk round there could do, and which, my dear little boy, would not have been right for him to do, as a great many things are not, which one both can do, and would like very much to do. So Mr. Grimes touched his hat to him when he rode through the town, and called him a burly old chap, and his young ladies, greyly lasses, which are two high compliments in the North Country, and thought that that made up for his poaching Sir John's pheasants, whereby you may perceive that Mr. Grimes had not been to a properly inspected Government National School. Now, I dare say, you never got up at three o'clock on a midsummer morning. Some people get up then because they want to catch salmon, and some because they want to climb Alps, and a great many more because they must, like Tom. But I assure you that three o'clock on a midsummer morning is the pleasantest time of all the twenty-four hours, and all the three hundred and sixty-five days, and why every one does not get up then, I never could tell save that they are all determined to spoil their nerves and their complexions by doing all night what they might just as well do all day. But Tom, instead of going out to dinner at half-past eight at night, and to a ball at ten, and finishing off somewhere between twelve and four, went to bed at seven, when his master went to the public-house, and slept like a dead pig, for which reason he was as pert as a gamecock, who always gets up early to wake the maids, and just ready to get up, when the fine gentlemen and ladies were just ready to go to bed. So he and his master set out. Grimes rode the donkey in front, and Tom and the brushes walked behind, out of the court and up the street, past the closed window shutters and the winking weary policemen, and the roofs all shining grey in the grey dawn. They passed through the pitman's village, all shut up and silent now, and through the turnpike, and then they were out in the real country, and plodding along the black dusty road between black slag walls, with no sound but the groaning and thumping of the pit-engine in the next field. But soon the road grew white, and the walls likewise, and at the wall's foot grew long grass and gay flowers, all drenched in dew, and instead of the groaning of the pit-engine, 
they heard the skylark saying his matins high up in the air, and the pit-bird warbling in the sedges, as he had warbled all night long. All else was silent, for old Mrs. Earth was still fast asleep, and, like many pretty people, she looked still prettier asleep than awake. The great elm-trees in the gold-green meadows were fast asleep above, and the cows fast asleep beneath them. Nay, the few clouds which were about were fast asleep likewise, and so tired that they had lain down on the earth to rest, in long white flakes and bars, among the stems of the elm-trees, and along the tops of the alders by the stream, waiting for the sun to bid them rise and go about their day's business, in the clear blue overhead. On they went, and Tom looked and looked, for he had never been so far into the country before, and longed to get over a gate and pick buttercups, and look for birds' nests in the hedge. But Mr. Grimes was a man of business, and would not have heard of that. Soon they came up with a poor Irishwoman, trudging along with a bundle at her back. She had a grey shawl over her head, and a crimson madder petticoat, so you may be sure she came from Galway. She had neither shoes nor stockings, and limped along, as if she were tired and footsore but she was a very tall, handsome woman, with bright grey eyes, and heavy black hair hanging about her cheeks. And she took Mr. Grimes's fancy so much, that when he came alongside he called out to her, "'This is a hard road for a gravely foot like that. Will ye up, lass, and ride behind me?' But, perhaps, she did not admire Mr. Grimes's look and voice, for she answered quietly, "'No, thank you. I'd sooner walk with your little lad here.' "'You may please yourself,' growled Grimes, and went on smoking. So she walked beside Tom, and talked to him, and asked him where he lived, and what he knew, and all about himself, till Tom thought he had never met such a pleasant-spoken woman. And she asked him at last whether he said his prayers, and seemed sad when he told her that he knew no prayers to say. Then he asked her where she lived and she said, Far away by the sea. And Tom asked her about the sea, and she told him how it rolled and roared over the rocks in winter nights, and lay still in the bright summer days for the children to bathe and play in it, and many a story more, till Tom longed to go and see the sea, and bathe in it likewise. At last, at the bottom of a hill, they came to a spring. Not such a spring as you see here, which soaks up out of a white gravel in the bog, among red fly-catchers, and pink bottle-heath, and sweet white orchis. Nor such a one as you may see too here, which bubbles up under the warm sand-bank, in the hollow lane, by the great tuft of lady-ferns, and makes the sand-dance reels at the bottom day and night all the year round. Not such a spring as either of those, but a real north-country limestone fountain, like one of those in Sicily, or Greece, where the old heathen fancied the nymphs sat cooling themselves the hot summer's day, while the shepherds peeped at them from behind the bushes. Out of a low cave of rock, at the foot of a limestone crag, the great fountain rose, quelling and burbling and gurgling, so clear that you could not tell where the water ended and the air began, and ran away under the road, a stream large enough to turn a mill, among blue geranium, and golden globe-flower, and wild raspberry, and the bird-cherry with its tassels of snow. And there Grimes stopped, and looked, and Tom looked too. Tom was wondering if anything lived in that dark cave, and came out at night to fly in the meadows. But Grimes was not wondering at all. Without a word he got off his donkey, and clambered over the low road wall, and knelt down, and began dipping his ugly head into the spring, and very dirty he made it. Tom was picking the flowers as fast as he could. The Irishwoman helped him, and showed him how to tie them up, and very pretty nosegay they had made between them. But when he saw Grimes actually wash, he stopped, quite astonished, and when Grimes had finished, and began shaking his ears to dry them, he said, "'Why, Master, I never saw you do that before.' nor will again, most likely. 'Twasn't for cleanliness I did it, but for coolness. 
I'd be ashamed to want washing every week or so, like any smutty collier lad. "'I wish I might go and dip my head in,' said poor little Tom. "'It must be as good as putting it under the town pump, and there is no beadle here to drive a chap away.' "'Thou come along,' said Grimes. "'What dost thou want with washing thyself? Thou did not drink a half-gallon of beer last night like me.' "'I don't care for you,' said Naughty Tom, and ran down to the stream and began washing his face. Grimes was very sulky, because the woman preferred Tom's company to his. So he dashed at him with horrid words, and tore him up from his knees and began beating him. But Tom was accustomed to that, and got his head safe between Mr. Grimes's legs, and kicked his shins with all his might. "'Are you not ashamed of yourself, Thomas Grimes?' cried the Irishwoman over the wall. Grimes looked up, startled at her knowing his name. But all he answered was, "'No, nor never was yet,' and went on beating Tom. "'True for you. If you ever had been ashamed of yourself, you would have gone over into Vendale long ago.' "'What do you know about Vendale?' shouted Grimes. But he left off beating Tom. "'I know about Vendale, and about you too.' I know, for instance, what happened in Aldermire Copse by night two years ago come Martin Mass. "'You do?' shouted Grimes, and leaving Tom he climbed up over the wall and faced the woman. Tom thought he was going to strike her, but she looked him too full and fierce in the face for that. "'Yes, I was there,' said the Irishwoman, quietly. "'You are no Irishwoman by your speech,' said Grimes, after many bad words. "'Never mind who I am. I saw what I saw, and if you strike that boy again I can tell what I know.' Grimes seemed quite cowed, and got on his donkey without another word. "'Stop,' said the Irishwoman. "'I have one more word for you both, for you will both see me again before all is over. Those that wish to be clean, clean they will be. And those that wish to be foul, foul they will be. Remember—' and she turned away and threw a gate into the meadow. Grimes stood still a moment, like a man who has been stunned. Then he rushed after her, shouting, "'You come back!' But when he got into the meadow, the woman was not there. Had she hidden away? There was no place to hide in. But Grimes looked about, and Tom also, for he was as puzzled as Grimes himself at her disappearing so suddenly. But look where they would, she was not there. Grimes came back again, as silent as a post, for he was a little frightened, and, getting on his donkey, filled a fresh pipe and smoked away, leaving Tom in peace. And now they had gone three miles and more, and came to Sir John's lodge-gates. Very grand lodges they were, with very grand iron gates, and stone gate-posts, and on the top of each a most dreadful bogey, all teeth, horns, and tail, which was the crest which Sir John's ancestors wore in the Wars of the Roses. And very prudent men they were to wear it, for all their enemies must have run for their lives at the very first sight of them. Grimes rang at the gate, and out came a keeper on the spot, and opened. "'I was told to expect thee,' he said. Now thou'lt be as good as to keep to the main avenue, and not let me find a hare or rabbit on thee when thou comest back. I shall look sharp for one, I tell thee. Not if it's in the bottom of the soot-bag, quoth Grimes, and at that he laughed, and the keeper laughed and said, If that's thy sort, I may as well walk up with thee to the hall. I think thou best had. It's thy business to see after thy game, man, and not mine. So the keeper went with them and to Tom's surprise, he and Grimes chatted together all the way quite pleasantly. He did not know that a keeper is only a poacher turned outside in, and a poacher a keeper turned inside out. They walked up a great lime avenue, a full mile long, and between their stems Tom peeped trembling at the horns of the sleeping deer, which stood up among the ferns. Tom had never seen such enormous trees, and as he looked up, he fancied that the blue sky rested on their heads. But he was puzzled very much by a strange murmuring noise, 
which followed them all the way. So much puzzled, that at last he took courage to ask the keeper what it was. He spoke very civilly, and called him Sir, for he was horribly afraid of him, which pleased the keeper, and he told him that they were the bees around the lime-flowers. "'What are bees?' asked Tom. "'What make honey?' "'What is honey?' asked Tom. "'Thou hold thy noise,' said Grimes. "'Let the boy be,' said the keeper. "'He's a civil young chap now, and that's more than he'll be long if he bides with thee.' Grimes laughed, for he took that as a compliment. "'I wish I were a keeper,' said Tom, "'to live in such a beautiful place, and wear green velveteens, and have a real dog-whistle at my button, like you.' The keeper laughed. He was a kind-hearted fellow enough. "'Let well alone, lad, and ill too at times. Thy life's safer than mine at all events, eh, Mr. Grimes?' And Grimes laughed again and then the two men began talking, quite low. Tom could hear, though, that it was about some poaching fight, and at last Grimes said surlily, "'Hast thou anything against me?' "'Not now.' "'Then don't ask me any questions till thou hast, for I am a man of honour." And at that they both laughed again, and thought it a very good joke. And by this time they were come up to the great iron gates in front of the house, and Tom stared through them at the rhododendrons and azaleas, which were all in flower, and then at the house itself, and wondered how many chimneys there were in it, and how long ago it was built, and what was the man's name that built it, and whether he got much money for his job. These last were very difficult questions to answer. For Harthover had been built at ninety different times, and in nineteen different styles, and looked as if somebody had built a whole street of houses of every imaginable shape, and then stirred them together with a spoon. For the attics were Anglo-Saxon, the third door Norman, the second Sanxento, the first floor Elizabethan, the right wing pure Doric, the centre early English, with a huge portico copied from the Parthenon, the left wing pure Boeotian, which the country folk admired most of all, because it was just like the new barracks in the town, only three times as big. The grand staircase was copied from the catacombs at Rome, the back staircase from the Taj Mahal at Agra. This was built by Sir John's great-great-great-uncle, who won, in Lord Clive's Indian Wars, plenty of money, plenty of wounds, and no more taste than his betters. The cellars were copied from the caves of Elephanta, the offices from the pavilion at Brighton, and the rest from nothing in heaven or earth or under the earth. So that Harthover House was a great puzzle to antiquarians, and a thorough Naboth's vineyard to critics, and architects, and all persons who like meddling with other men's business, and spending other men's money. So they were all setting upon poor Sir John, year after year, and trying to talk him into spending a hundred thousand pounds or so, in building, to please them and not himself. But he always put them off, like a canny north countryman, as he was. One wanted him to build a Gothic house, but he said he was no Goth, and another to build an Elizabethan, but he said he lived under good Queen Victoria, and not good Queen Bess, and another was bold enough to tell him that his house was ugly, but he said he lived inside it and not outside and another that there was no unity in it. But he said that was just why he liked the old place. For he liked to see how each Sir John, and Sir Hugh, and Sir Ralph, and Sir Randall, had left his mark upon the place, each after his own taste. And he had no more notion of disturbing his ancestors' work than of disturbing their graves. For now the house looked like a real live house that had a history, and had grown and grown as the world grew, and that it was only an upstart fellow, who did not know who his own grandfather was, who would change it for some spick-and-span new Gothic or Elizabethan thing, which looked as if it had been all spawned in a night as mushrooms are. From which you may collect, if you have wit enough, that Sir John was a very sound-headed, sound-hearted squire, and just the man to keep the countryside in order, and show good sport with his hounds. But Tom and his master did not go in through the great iron gates, as if they had been dukes or bishops, but round the back way, 
and a very long way round it was, and into a little back door, where the ash-boy let them in, yawning horribly. And then in a passage the housekeeper met them, in such a flowered chintz dressing-gown, that Tom mistook her for my lady herself. And she gave Grimes solemn orders about, "'You will take care of this, and take care of that,' as if he was going up the chimneys, and not Tom. And Grimes listened, and said every now and again, under his voice, "'You'll mind that, you little beggar.' And Tom did mind, at least all that he could. And then the housekeeper turned them into a grand room, all covered up in sheets of brown paper, and bade them begin, in a lofty and tremendous voice. And so, after a whimper or two, and a kick from his master, into the grate Tom went, and up the chimney, while a housemaid stayed in the room to watch the furniture, to whom Mr. Grimes paid many playful and chivalrous compliments, but met with very slight encouragement in return. End of chapter 1, part 1